Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. I'm very happy to be here and see a lot of old friends and meeting new friends. It's just great. So I'm going to be talking about something that's a little new for our lab, the uh, normal and disordered aging. And uh, as a sort of overview, I'd like to just go over, I'll be going over some ways of approaching the topic of musical memory from a behavioral standpoint. My background is in cognitive psychology, so what I'll be using is a, you know, a sort of cognitive behavioral approach, although I realize, of course, there's a lot of other ways we could be looking at this. And specifically, what are the effects of normal aging and the effects of dementia on musical memories? And normal aging is very important here because we need to track exactly what's happening with normal aging to see if the demented are actually worse or, in fact, they're showing just normal um, decay processes. To put this in a little bit of context, there's a lot of work on musical loss and musical sparing. Um, patterns of loss following brain damage, there's been lots of work of this with the Peretz group at, and lots of the Brahms people have been working on that. Then of course you'll know about the congenital amusia that Isabel has been working on and uh, aka tone deafness. And I'll be talking a bit about the loss with Alzheimer's because it's not a clear picture. <laughs> then in preservation there are a few studies of preservation of music abilities following brain damage. The uh, flagship sort of story is the composer Shebelin, who was still composing after a very major stroke. Uh, in special populations, there's preservation, such as the Williams syndrome that Dan Levitin has been working on. And I'll be showing you and hoping to convince you that there are some patterns of preservation in Alzheimer's. This is contentious. Not all, everybody buys it. So in my outline, I'll just go over a few test paradigms that you could, one could use to study musical memory. And then I'll talk a little bit about the participants that are recruited for these studies, and then I'll spend most of the time on the current studies and wrap up with a few um, conclusions or comments more. Now, the paradigms that we could use, there's lots, and the ones I'm just going to talk about today are the same different paradigm. That's simply where you play a melody, and then you play another melody following it, it's either the same or it's got a change in it. And you ask the person, is it the same melody or is it changed? Um, this is a very simple task. I'm not going to use, uh, there is a law in psychology, um, theoretical constructs around these paradigms. I don't want to get into that because it's complicated and um, somewhat contentious. So I'm just going to stick with paradigms. Same, different. Tonal knowledge, that is our ability to have learned the tonal structure of our cultural idiom. And this is not necessarily Western. It exists in other cultures. And the most, uh, I guess, famous technique to get at this is the probe tone technique. There are other ways, but this is very, very well studied. Then the old new recognition task, I'll be spending most of my time actually on the latter two because they, there's more work on the aging and the um, dementia with the last two. The old new recognition test is been, uh, highly studied. And then long-term familiarity uh, through do you recognize the tunes of your youth, the tunes you learned at church or, or camp or parties and stuff like that? And can you sing them? So when we talk about participants, generally, when I summarize or our own, young people are the young uh, available undergraduates, uh, 17 to 23. The elderly are usually recruited from communities, um, senior citizens and community services. And we have them at about 65 to 85. Aid the um, Alzheimer's dementias at uh, various levels of severity, usually within that same age group. We have one or two that are a bit older, but that's about the same age group. Now, on the note, I'd just like to say on music education, it, this, is a, this is a hard one because, it's first of all, it's very difficult to quantify. If you're a music teacher, you know that a kid comes in with 12 years of music training is not the same as another kid that comes in with 12 years of music training. There could be huge differences. And yet that's what most of us in psychology tend to quantify is you know, the number of years. Now, with our young, we have a very extensive questionnaire. We do interviews, et cetera, et cetera. With our elderly, we also do questionnaires. But again, you'll get an elderly person come in and says, well, I only had two years in, you know, piano lessons somewhere. But then they've sung in church choirs. They've sung in community choirs. They've done this and that in, with music. So you can't say this person has only two years. It is a very complicated business. And that's part of something I'm working on right now. But for the data I'm going to show you, the music ed really doesn't factor in. And we're going to show you that there is a huge corpus of musical knowledge that's just out there. It's part of our cultural experience. So that's what we'll be talking about today. And I'll, the music ed is another part of, of, of kind of my research agenda. So 
uh, when we, I got started in thinking about the Alzheimer work, I came across this quotation in a paper by Isabel Peretz. And this is a, important because it kind of summarizes in this one paragraph a lot of knowledge. First of all, we know that musical functions can be impaired or spared in a highly selective fashion. And one important area, she says, is in which evaluations of musical skill would be highly valuable is dementia. And then she says, but we really know very little about it. Yet, it is widely acknowledged, you talk to music therapists, you talk to caregivers, you talk to families, and say that the demented patients really enjoy music. And yet, when I move around, this is not believed by many people. It's not the researchers who don't buy it, and there are hospital administrators that don't buy it. Fortunately, in Kingston, they, you know, we do have activity programs. We don't have a registered music therapist in Kingston, but we do have uh, programs for activity programs at the homes and the hospitals. But there are places where this is not allowed or even um, expected. And maybe one of our hopes of some of our data is that we can uh, support with data the people that believe that there is this sparing. A few things on Alzheimer's. I know some of you work on this, so you can maybe skip over the next few slides. But if you don't know a great deal about it, these are very, very brief review. Uh, it's amazing that it is uh, have, was discovered 100, over 100 years ago. And uh, it was this psychiatrist, Alzheimer, and he presented a case history, and then he presented his findings in 1907. And I was surprised I found out that he actually did the histology. I mean, it was the histological techniques were available, and he did it to find out what were the, in fact, the um, neural degeneration that was going on. But there's been very little research and no cure. Uh, this is from the Alzheimer's Society. There's a picture of Alzheimer's, and that's his famous patient, the first patient that was recorded with this particular form of dementia. What we also know is that it's very prevalent among the elderly. It depends on what source you read, what percentages you pick up. But this is kind of standard, 10% over 65, 47% over age 85. It's progressive, it's degenerative, and there's no known cure. Now, it does... Uh, affect transmission at different rates. So you will get one patient that will start, will lose language before it loses the visual spatial, and another one, the visual spatial before the language. Where the music fits in has just not been studied very much, but it is now pretty much accepted that there are many, many different profiles uh, of the way the impairment happens. But the final diagnosis is based on these characteristic plaques and tangles in brain tissue. And here again from the Alzheimer's Society is a, where you can sort of see the amyloid plaques that form in cortical tissue and tangles in, with, in neural tissue, of neurofibrillary tangles. Here you see a normal brain and a, the atrophy of a demented brain. Um, this is considered, the plaques and tangles are usually um, uncovered at autopsy or post-mortem. That's the final diagnosis. Now, I know uh, the people at the Baycrest are using tracers and uh, getting, you know, with live people and that, and what you will not like to know is that a lot of us are walking around with plaques and tangles, except we're not demented. So it's not a complete one-on-one -on -one connection. It's, it's kind of confirmatory, but it doesn't mean if you did have plaques and tangles that you'd have the disease. Now, here's the be some behavioral materials. This uh, is from... Um, a friend of mine in the medical school, and this is what he uses with his uh, second year medical students to just get them the behavioral sense of the stages of dementia. In the first stage, the really obvious thing is the memory loss. And often people are aware of the memory loss, and they'll go to the doctor and say, you know, I've got, I've got some sort of memory loss. But usually the family is the one to pick it up. There can be language problems, mood swings, personality change, and diminished judgment. But they don't all happen, but some of them happen. And then in the moderate stage, you have more serious personality changes, the inability to learn or recall new information, long-term memory affected. Then you get the problem of the wandering and agitation. So they can't really be left home alone because they'll start wandering. And they, that means that they really, you have to have somebody with them all the time. You don't necessarily uh, have to be hospitalized at that point, but they have to have help. That AD is uh, activities of daily living, and they do have to have help with it. And then when we get severe, then it gets really bad. It just progresses inevitably to these stages. You, I've noticed it myself and my participants, the gait starts to go, even maybe even the moderate stages. 
Uh, they are usually bedridden or in wheelchairs. They're incontinent. They're unable to perform any activities of daily living. They have to be fed, washed, and so forth. And unless, although there are some cases, I know at least three in our samples, where they're being kept at home and being looked after by a spouse, but usually they must be put in long-term care. Now, the assessment is difficult. It's not um, 100%, but the medics are pretty good at this. And actually, with the uh, postmortems, they're probably about 95% correct these days. They get the medical history, the physical exam, there's brain scans, but that's usually done in the mild stages to rule out a reversible form of dementia, that is a tumor, or to find out if this person's had a stroke or so forth. Uh, this not used, I mean, the, at Baker's they're using it now to try to get at uh, more detailed notions of atrophy, but it's not, the, the field is not all that there yet. And then there's tons of psychological tests. I'll only mention a few. Um, particularly the one I'll mention is the MMSE, which is the Mini Mental Status Evaluation, and that's the one we always use because it's a kind of gold standard out there that you uh, report on your elderlies and your patients. Now, the Mini Mental, if you're not familiar with it, is a very simple test if you're wide awake and healthy brained. Uh, it's sort of, where are you, kind of question. And mind you, we do give our elderlies a bit of uh, slack on that because the Queen Psychology of the Building looks like every psych building built in the 1970s. And if they don't know that they're in a psych building, we don't blame them because it's just gray and amorphous. You know, so they say they're on Queen's campus. We say, fine, you got it. And, <laughs> and you know, you yeah, have uh, a few words to recall, name objects, uh, follow a command, read a sentence, write a sentence. It's very, very simple. And uh, a healthy elderly person should get a very high score on this. Um, these are the sort of, the scores out of 30 and uh, 24 and up is considered normal and then 20 to 23 mild and it goes down from there. Uh, in our work, we require 28 um, because we just want to make absolutely sure that the problem with a little bit lower than that is you might be running into something called mild cognitive impairment, and that's a whole different kind of uh, kettle of diagnosis that uh, is, um, we just think we better um, treat separately or look at separately. Now, well, I'll go over some findings from those four um, paradigms that I mentioned before. The same different, the tonal knowledge, the old new recognition, and then the long-term familiarity. Now, with same different, I did quite a lot of work on this in the 80s, if I may mention such a long time ago, but and so did Jay Dowling. And we did a lot of work with sort of structural properties of these melodies. But I'll give, show you a few more recent uh, papers, don't, uh, just to show you, there's quite a lot of work on this, on this idea. And those of you from uh, Brahms will know Peretz's uh, MBEA paradigms. And here you can see at the top, there's a nice tonal stimulus. And what is varied here are the kinds of comparisons that you might be asked to judge against that standard. So in the second line, we have uh, where the asterisk is, you can see that there's a note that it's the same contour, but it's out of the key. So that should be pretty easy, and it is for most people. In the next line, the contour changes, but the note's in the key. In the next line, the contour is the same, and the note is in the key, so you have to make an interval judgment on that. And in the very last same different, then we see that the rhythm's been changed, that uh, the note values have been changed slightly, so that the groupings, here you have that grouping, then da 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 and then here da 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 you know, and so there's a difference in grouping, and you're asked, is that same or different? Now, all I'm going to say about, we've done quite a lot of work with this too, and is that the structural properties of the melodies are very important in a same different task. If your uh, standard melody is tonal, it's a lot easier than if it violates some of the tonal properties. Music training is implicated here. Musicians do better than non-musicians. And here I'm saying, you know, young people, some with, in the music school versus young people who have not had very much training. It is implicated, but not very much. I mean, the musicians are sort of more accurate, but they follow the same pattern of results. They all respond to tonality in the same way. They respond to contour in the same way. So it's not. Now, we really don't know about aging. I was talking to Isabel two weeks ago, and she said, uh, a systematic study of aging has not been done with the same different paradigm. I have a little bit of data in the paper with Willie Steinke. That was an earlier version of the MBEA. And we ran 12 or so, 20 controls, elderly controls, and they were fine. They were really 
quite okay. And I looked at Isabel's Excel data on the internet, and they <laughs> or looked, checked out some old people, and they were doing really well. So I suspect that, although this study really needs to be done, that aging is not going to be implicated very much. Moreover, on dementia, I'm going to leave this one. Uh, I found two papers from the 90s. One said there were some effects in dementia, and the other one was the Creo paper where Robert Zetorp was involved, and it said there weren't. So I'm going to leave this as a cold case. I think we're going to get back to it. I think it might be differences in the stimuli, and I think it deserves some further work. Uh, I suspect, again, it will be very slight. If aging is slight, I suspect it's slight. Now, the tonal knowledge, some of you may know some of the Crumhansel work. Uh, this is just a couple of 1990 book, and that's a paper in Journal of New Music Research. The probe tone technique is a very simple one to set up. You present a context. It can be anything that is key defining. It could be a major triad. It could be a chord cadence. It could be um, even a simple interval, a CE, a CEG. Um, and, or it could be a scale, or it could be a melody in a given key, and then you play one of the tones of the chromatic scale, and you say, how well does that fit that context? How well does the probe fit the context? So it's a very simple thing to set up, and here's some very classic data from some early work of Carol's uh, with Eddie Kessler, and what you see is the probe tone on the x-axis and the average rating of goodness of fit on the y-axis. And for a C major profile, if, it's in the, if your context is in the key of C, People really like the tonic C, then the dominant, the mediant, and then the other scale notes, and they tend to reject the non-scale notes. No real big surprises here, and it's certainly highly convergent with, say, music theoretic proposals by Fred Lairdahl uh, on his pitch space. But it's just interesting that we can quantify it, and I'll explain it a little bit more in a minute. Uh, here's the C minor, very similar. Interestingly, the mediant comes up higher than the dominant with a C minor profile, and it may be that the mediant is cueing the fact that this is in a minor mode, and it's more important. But anyway, these data have been replicated tons of times, and so we kind of treat them as a sort of standardized profile for tonality. And then what you can do is try something a little bit more interesting or unusual as your context, and then compare it against what you've got from a standard context. Uh, what do we know here? They, again, there are effects of music training, but they're not very big. Musicians will give you just more differentiation you know, just, their profile is just like a little bit more sharp and uh, uh, clearly differentiated. But there are a lot of non-musicians who give you beautiful sharp profiles. You know, they're really, really good at this. They're, actually, I think there's only a few non-musicians that, for this is a kind of meaningless task, and they might be among Isabel's uh, musics, you know, that would be another kind of test of amusia. Now, Andrea Halpern did a study in 1996 where she did test old people on this, and they were just fine. They, so we do have that feeling that you can maintain knowledge of the tonal hierarchy well into your 60s and 70s. We don't know what the effects of dementia are on this, but I think we can get at it in other ways. I think it would be difficult, although not impossible perhaps, with a demented patient to use this technique because you have to explain what goodness of fit meant and so forth. But there might be other ways of getting at it, for instance, just playing a melody and getting some of the notes wrong, and I'll show you some of that later on. Now, the old new recognition, now we're getting into some, where we got some really a lot more data than those other two paradigms. This has been studied extensively by uh, Isabel Perez, Luis Gagnon, Sylvie Belvi, and, the, and colleagues, and by Andrea Halpern, and Jay Dowling, Jim Bartlett, and others. And again, it's this pretty straightforward paradigm. What I'm talking about today are paradigms that are actually pretty simple to set up. What's labor intensive is the testing of the patients, the elderly and the patients. So you give your people a study list of melodies you know, set of melodies, and you ask them to listen to them several times. And then you give them a test list where you have study melodies and then new melodies, and you scramble them up, and you say, okay, which ones did you hear in the study list and which ones are new? So it's pretty simple. And that way, you can have something called recognition of an unfamiliar melody, which sounds kind of strange when you stop and think about it. But of course, if there are unfamiliar melodies in the study list, then you're asking your people to pick out those that were in the study list, those unfamiliars that were in the study list. So um, now you can do millions, tons of manipulations on this. You can have familiar versus unfamiliar melodies in the study list. You can, have, you can explicitly ask people, I'm going to give you these melodies. You've got to remember them because I'm going to test you later. Or you can just give them, say, just listen to them. You know, Then I'll, we'll do something else later. Or you can ask them, as Andrea did in the test I'm going to show you, uh, to just say, how fast is this melody going? In other words, you're not giving them a cue that you might get tested later. 
And then a test, you can say, okay, this is a recognition test, which are old and which are new, or you can give them something totally different. You can say, I want you now to tell me how pleasant each melody is. Because that's based on the uh, very long psychological construct called the exposure effect, that if you hear things many times, you will develop an implicit memory for them. And if you're asked for the likingness, the melodies that you heard should be more pleasant than the ones that are new. And of course, you can manipulate the number of study trials. Now, we have, um, in general, and I um, would like to recommend a, a couple of papers to you by Andrea Halpern, a review paper. She's, she's got a 2000 paper in psychomusicology on aging, and there's one coming out. It's a chapter in preparation, but she was great, gracious enough to give me a copy of. She has some wonderful just ways of summarizing a lot of complicated data. But so uh, these are, I think, are kind of, although there's uh, you know, qualifications on different parameters, the effects of music training are slight on this one. They're very, very little, few effects of music training. Aging is pronounced. And dementia, in addition to aging, may be further pronounced. Now, I said may because I'll show you what can happen as a problem here, and I think I foreshadowed it a little bit. Um, our current study, we are extending a paper by Halpern and O'Connor in 2000. And they presented eight unfamiliar melodies, two times each, with instructions at the time of presentation, how fast is this melody going? So they go through this, and people comply. And then they had 16 melodies in the test series, eight of the old ones and eight of the new. And the listeners were asked to respond, is this old or is this new? And then rate the pleasantness. Now, here's the Halpern data. Well, no, what we did, I'm oh, sorry, this is our current study, and then I'll do them together. Our study is very similar, except we noted that their elderlies were really quite low. So we kind of made it a little easier for our elderly by presenting three times with explicit instructions. You're going to be tested on this later. That's the only difference. Now, when you, uh, we have 40 um, young adults, 40 elderly healthies, 12 mild dementia, and uh, 8 mild cognitive impairment, which is amnestic problems, problems with memory, but don't show any of the other signs of dementia. And my colleague, uh, Dr. Angie Garcia, who runs the memory clinic at Queens, was interested to find out would they sort of fall in between the Alzheimer and the normal. So this is a kind of pilot study on the MCIs. Now you can see the problem with the Halpern's data is that she, her young were 85% uh, correct on this test, and she was kind of discouraged. She thought they should have been better than that. I thought it's not bad, you know, but she thought they should have been better. But the old and the AD are, re are not good. And you can't tell when the ADs are down at 60% correct, which really is not much above chance. And many of the old people were not getting it at all. You can't tell whether there's a difference due to aging or the disease. So our reason for giving them an extra trial and the explicit instructions was to try to bump up their performance a bit. And that was successful. You see, in our data, we, uh, our youngs are a little bit better, as we expected. The olds are a little bit better, as we expected. But the, our AD and MCIs are just bombing out. They just cannot do it. So we've got real uh, serious loss here. And the other measure is the pleasantness. Now, what you do here is you take the ratings of pleasantness for the old melodies and subtract the rating from pleasantness for the new. And it should be positive if you're, you're getting this exposure effect. And yes, it's positive, but it's not very big. I mean, this is not a terribly subtle technique because you're not getting, you know, yes, that's significantly above, you know, chance, but uh, it's not very, doing very well. And with our people, yes, the young were, you know, they got up to half a scale point, wow, in a five point scale. The old's not so good, but the Alzheimer and the MCIs are out. You know, they just aren't showing any, even any implicit memory here. So this would kind of go along with the fact that, you know, the cup is empty. As uh, Andrea and I have been talking about this, is the cup half full or half empty? And, you know, this looks pretty empty. So then the next question is, what about these long-term memory effects that we've been told about, that caregivers tell us about, and so on? And we did find in the literature several papers. There's one or there's a, at least two or three more, but these are just give you a sort of sample that are out there that say that there are old people with moderate or severe dementia that can play. And in psychology, you may recognize that as procedural memories. These are unconscious memories like riding a bike. You can't tell anybody how you do it, but you just do it. And you'll notice that they are all pretty highly trained professionals. And then they are able to play 
uh, music at this level of skill. Uh, I've also was told, just as in a little bit of a side, I was telling uh, my former thesis supervisor was Endel Toving, and uh, I was telling him about these data, and he said that the KC that he's working on, the KC has uh, traumatic brain damage, but he still has this procedural memory for playing uh, on a synthesizer. So, but you see, what we were more interested in was not the highly skilled professional with procedural memory, but the memories of just the average person. The average person who has sung uh, here and there through a lifetime, maybe uh, tunes they learned as kids, things they sung to their grandchildren. Is there any of that spared? And so we, when we got started, we realized that we were going to face a lot of research challenges. One is recruitment, because we have recruited occasionally in hospitals, but it's not a very good place, at least not for us in Kingston, because people aren't hospitalized until they have a lot of other symptoms, psychotic symptoms, and they're on heavy antipsychotics and pretty, um, uh, pretty bad shape, actually. So we recruit from the community, but it takes a long time to uh, get through to the caregivers that, you know, they're, the mother is really going to enjoy these tests. They're going to enjoy singing along and listening to the funny melodies and so forth. Most caregivers, I mean, it's a very stressful situation. This is a horrible disease, and they just don't want their loved one humiliated in testing situations. So you really have to do a lot of going out and talking and stuff like that to kind of convince people about this. Uh, Pre-morbid assessment is very difficult because if you're lucky, you'll get a spouse that uh, with a couple that have been together a very long time, but if you get the kids, well, they're not the kids anymore, you know, 50-year-olds or whatever, but they may not know. Well, I think mom had piano lessons, you know, but they never, you know, they don't know. So it's very difficult to get these assessments uh, from way, way back in life. Now, with the length and timing of tests, I mean, it would be nice, I know I did some work with a stroke patient, and you could go on and on and on, because once the condition stabilizes after about six months, that person's going to be often quite okay for years and years and years. With the Alzheimer's, you've got to get in there fast, and you've got to get in there with short tests because they tire quickly, and their, their condition change, rapidly changes. You can't say, okay, I'll wait till I develop you know, pilot work on this particular test, and I'll come back, because they may be in a totally different state of the dementia. And of course, there's attrition. We've lost several of our patients uh, over the last year. And then the question was how to get response measures when you, from a severely demented person. And so there we came up with the idea of behavioral observation. And if all goes well, I'll be able to show you a video of a severely demented person. Uh, we just turn the video on and we just play the little pieces of music and watch. Do they sing along? Do they respond with facial animation? Do they respond with gestures and so forth? And really, although I do have it independently scored, you know, blind scored, and the correlations are, you know, the reliability coefficients are up around 90%, it's very easy to score. I mean, it's very, very obvious. It's not that we're looking for little, you know, twitches or something. It's really obvious whether they recognize or not. Now, with the moderates, mild and moderates, usually uh, we don't go, we, we do do the videos, but they t tend to get a bit more sense that, oh, this is kind of a test, but with the severes, there's no idea that it's a test. They just think, well, you know, the, here's a nice young student come in and wants to sing melodies with me. So this is our, fir this was our first patient um, that we published in 2005. And she was an older lady, and I, uh, she's the one I have a video of, uh, in a long-term care facility. She was very demented. You see the mini mentals there is eight. She didn't know her family, she didn't know her children, she didn't know where she was. Um, she was very disoriented. But she had loved music, and when I look back on it, I think that one thing that might have helped a bit is that the family had moved a complete uh, hi-fi system into her room so that she could listen to opera, operatic music that she loved so much. So the tests we tried, the uh, familiarity decision comes from the early version of the MBEA, uh, the Liège au Cheval, um, and it's just simply 10 familiar melodies, five are songs, five are instrumentals, mixed up with 10 foils. And what's quite brilliant about this test is that the foils are the familiars in retrograde, but then, you know, kind of massaged a bit so that they're not syncopated, but you're really using the kind of same pitch material. And the lyrics prompt is that we just measured, we give them sort of... Um, monotonic lyrics, silent night, holy night, all this, and just see if we could prompt them to sing back. 
The famous melodies is one we use with our stroke patient. I don't use it too much anymore because it's awfully long. It's 115 melodies, and um, it just takes days to get through the famous melodies. And distorted tunes, you may have heard of this, Dennis Drana's distorted tunes. He started a, this um, as a genetic study. He was trying to see whether and get genetic uh, coefficients on whether twins uh, were more likely to be the same on, on this. And it's something like this. Well, it's terribly easy to hear the distortion. I mean, it's, if you have the America the Beautiful at the top and then the distortion uh, distorts that interval and then follows the contour. But I mean, that is really, really obvious to most people. But about, they argue, about 5% of the population cannot tell the difference. And we have some examples of this later on. So our results for EN, now EN is in the blue or purple, or, uh, and then the yellow is controls. Um, you can see that on almost all tests, even the lyrics pop out, that was an early test where we only had four lyrics. So she's getting three out of four. She's not doing too bad. And on all the rest, she's really doing very well. I mean, she's really enjoying these tests. She's singing back to us. And we were very encouraged that maybe there is something in our you know, this ability to retrieve familiar melodies. So it was very enjoyable. We tried the test several times. Uh, she got slower. But she never picked up on the novel, which I thought was kind of interesting because we were getting very bored with them by the time we'd done it several times. And then she passed away in 2005. I mention that because we were criticized in print for not having neuroimaging on her. Now, you do not do that to a severely demented patient. It would be frightening. I'm sure the family wouldn't allow it in the, anyway. Uh, you couldn't explain the procedures. And, but we did get a postmortem. The family wanted a postmortem. They're very, very supportive of this research. And mainly the postmortem guy, just you know, to make sure that the diagnosis is correct. Because we haven't said, oh, well, if she got those melodies, it wasn't really AD. But all the postmortem data were that all the neuro changes were quite consistent, quite consistent. But what was interesting is what he also gave us was that there was mild to moderate cerebral atrophy in the frontal lobes and in the medial temporal. And we've also been said, well, she must have intact medial temporals. But no, she doesn't. So this is quite a puzzle. This is quite a puzzle. Now we followed that with three more participants. I'll go through, I'll just keep my hand on the time. Um, fairly quickly, the, we used the um, familiarity decision again. We used the lyrics prompt again and the distorted tunes. And then um, Ashley, uh, my graduate student, made up a new test of unfamiliar distorteds. Because if you get, pick up the mistake in a distorted, there are two ways you could do it. You could say, well, it's just not a literal copy of the melody that I you know, or it's just got bad notes, out of tune notes. So with the undis unfamiliars, if they do get that, they have to be able to pick up, there's a key violation here. There's something wrong with the tonality. Now this is um, our second participant. She was 81 years old. Uh, she was a high school education. She was moderately impaired, although she's now really decreasing to severe impairment. We've done the tests again, and she still can do them. Um, she did very, very well. As you can see, her blue uh, bars are right up there within the, uh, well within the range of the controls. So she's, uh, she's quite lovely. This is the one, Dan, that we have on the musical brain, this lady. Uh, the next person is kind of interesting. She was actually quite severely demented. And she did have some behavioral disturbances, but she loved the music test. She, she had no, we, we didn't see any behavioral disturbances. She was absolutely fine with us and very cooperative. But I'll show you one thing that she d didn't do well. She's just fine on the familiarity decision, the lyrics prompt, she's pretty good. Distorted tunes recognition, that is, even if they were distorted, she can tell who, what they are and she can sing along. But she bombed whether they were distorted or not because we couldn't stop her from singing along. And we'd say, listen, listen, there's a distortion here. Or we didn't say distortion. Isn't there a wrong note or something like that? And uh, no, 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 no. And she would sing along, sing along. But you see, we, when she got onto the unfamiliar, where she couldn't sing along, because she didn't know them, you see, nobody knows them, then she was fine. She could pick up all the distortions, oh, any melody that was distorted. And then this last one I'll show you. He was a cranky old geezer. <laughs> he did not like this, this testing at all. And uh, he, he said, I said, question the value of the tests. And he came kind of a, now, he was OK on familiarity decision. He was OK on the distorted tunes. Did he recognize them even if they were distorted? 
but he didn't get any of the distortions at all. He just said, no, they all sound fine, they all sound fine. Now, whether he wanted to just get out of there or whether he really couldn't tell, that's an interesting question that we are going to be following up with a larger group of severely distorted. But um, just before I leave this old fellow, a uh, few months later, my grad student, Willie, was up in the ward and he said, I know you. And the wife said, no, you can't possibly, you can't possibly. And I thought, the poor old fellow, he's made a correct recognition and he's being told that he can't recognize. But fortunately, fortunately, Willie ran up and said, no, 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 he does know me because I was testing on the music test. So um, now another piece of, after we started, Jackie and I published that first paper, we got a lot of email and letters and whatever from caregivers who thought they were the only one that had noticed that there was this sparing. And they said, it's so wonderful to read your paper because, you know, this happened to us. Now, of course, this is highly biased. and We haven't published this, although Jackie is keen on narrative medicine. She's a, a medic in the medical school, and uh, she's keen on this. And she is going to try to trace the trajectory of the story. And it tends to be that everything is going downhill. You know, everything is just sort of, and everybody's getting kind of, this is it, you know, there's not going to be any more response from dad or mom or whatever. And then something triggers it. It can be a birthday party, it can be uh, suddenly something on television or uh, an event in the family. And in one case of this old kid, he, he got up, he was from the Maritimes, got up and played the spoons and the harmonica and danced, and it was just, the family just, you know, it was a birthday party, just was astounded. So we do get these stories. It's a kind of slow, slow decline, then some event kind of triggers this musical memory. And um, that's called narrative medicine, and so Jack is going to be working on that. So we found some encouraging support for the hypotheses that musical memory may be spared and that it can be reliably obsess uh, assessed, but it may, we also know that it's not always spared. I mean, there is a, par a point with a very, very low mini mental set, so there is no further response. But it's kind of uh, striking just how far one might uh, pursue this. So I'm going to um, just tell you about our larger current study that's going on. We've got 90 elderlies from the community. And as I said, we try to keep the criteria from Mini Mental pretty high. And we're using a pretty wide range of backgrounds here because eventually I'm going to be sort of sorting this out. But I can tell you right now that we've done a lot of stats so far on these elderlies. And there is no difference that according to um, their professional background, their music ed, or their um, just general status at all. And against that, we have 48 of the kids from Queens. And then we're now up to 32 Alzheimer participants. We have 17 at the mild stage, 8 at the moderate, and seven severe, we lost two of them. Um, not of that seven, we had nine originally. But they are generally comparable to the healthy elderlies. Now how I'm going to, the test that we used was a familiarity decision that I've showed you before. That's the one from the Liegeois Chauvel battery. Familiar lyrics we made up ourselves and uh, it, there's no way we can, and I'm not claiming in any way that these are parallel, because there's just no way you can make them absolutely parallel. Like, for the familiarity decision, the tunes are played retrograde or backwards to be novel tunes. You can't play lyrics backwards and make any sense at all. So you have to find lyrics that are comparable, but probably not well known. And we found in some very old songbooks, lyrics that probably, that they're lyrical, they have the same sort of topics like Christmas, and birthday, and harvesting, you know, those sort of standard topics. And uh, you know, the proof is just simply, in, can people discriminate between the familiar and the unfamiliars? The distorted tunes is the one I told you about, the Dennis Drena. Distorted lyrics is where we try to come up with a parallel, uh, not, I'm not making any claim that it's equivalent, but a parallel test where the lyrics have some grammatical distortion. We don't change the meaning, just sort of um, change some of the some of the words, uh, just to change the actual uh, gram grammatical structures. Lyrics prompt is like it was before. We just give them the lyrics and we say, can you sing the tune? Now we, we're now up to 10 lyrics. Again, you can't make these tests too long because you, your patient or your person will fall asleep. And uh, so we have the lyrics. From, and then the Proverbs completion was, that was my friend Jackie Dolphin. That was one of her 
pets, and she thought she'd try it on EN, and we found that EN, that was our very first patient, didn't do too well, but we wanted to see how others would do, and that's, that's different from intelligence tests. In intelligence tests, you are trying to get at them, do they get the meaning of the proverb? We're just saying, what's the literal ending of it? A stitch in time? We just want the ending of it. So it's much more literal, not meaning. Now, the way I'm going to present the data is as a box and whisker plot. Um, it's a very unforgiving way of plotting data because you show everything. <laughs> you, don't, you can't hide things under the standard error. Um, but what it is, if you're familiar with it, it's just simply, uh, this is the median response here. And the box is the 25th to the 75th percentile. And then the whiskers, that's the whisker here, and the whiskers are usually everything, but if anything is more than one and a half whisker lengths from the box, then it gets plotted as an outlier. So we'll see some outliers. But the story is really there in the boxes. I mean, it's, it's going to be pretty clear. Um, but, you know, you will see outliers. Okay, so um, this is the familiarity decision test from the... Liajah, Chauvel, and et al. And to the left, you see the effect of age, because here's our young people, and here's our old people, and then to the right is the effect of dementia, because we've got our mild, moderate, and severe. And that's the percent accuracy on the familiarity decision test. Now, actually, um, the old, healthy olds are doing the best, you're going to see several plots where healthy olders are better than young. The young are not very much down, um, but that is significant. The cursor is not showing up on the screen. Oh. There it is. There it is. Okay. The youngs are a little bit down. That is significant because they've got a very large N. And they don't get Ravel's Bolero. We went and checked. You know, what don't they get? <laughs> you know? There are cultural things, and uh, they... What do you mean not get? They didn't, uh, they thought it was unfamiliar. Yeah. Well, it would be for them. You don't hear it as much. I mean, we used to hear it all the time, and they don't hear it. Of course, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, but you see, here are old people. Are, oh, I've lost again here. Yeah. Here's the milds, here's the moderates, and here's the severes. And even the severes are not doing too badly. Okay. Um, with the familiar lyrics, everyone's doing very well. We have the young controls and the AD controls next to them. The mild AD, mm -hmm. the moderate AD and the severes over here. Now they're down. But notice that right up to the severe stages, they're doing very well on, these, on the lyrics. On the distorted tunes, now it's interesting, we're getting a bit of spread there on the normal controls. But really, I mean, that's only nine people, and we've got 90. I mean, we're talking, most of them are right up here. Uh, they're doing extremely well. The young, the, uh, oh, it's lost again. Yeah, the young, the aid, the healthy elderly, and then the three levels of Alzheimer. And we are doing, they're doing pretty well. Even the severes are doing a little bit, you know, they're responding reasonably well, but although, you know, we're starting to lose them. Now we really do start to lose the Alzheimer people with the distorted lyrics, with the lyrics that have distor distortions in them. Them has, or, you know, instead of the has or something. When the grammar is distorted, then we're starting to, to lose them somewhat. Then when we get to the lyrics prompt, that is where you're saying a few words in a very dry way and asking somebody to respond with the tune. Um, it's going to get a lot more variability, for one thing. Our old people are still doing very, very well. Uh, under the AD controls, our old people are still doing very, very well. We, there's a few that aren't, but you know, there's, that's only six out of 90, so that's, they're doing extremely well. 
Um, the young people are highly variable. The AD are getting highly variable, and the AD severe are really, really quite low, except for some. Some are still getting it. And we had one old lady uh, that simply got them all. And she was so demented, really. Her stage was so bad that she thought the testers were her grandchildren, and she invited them in, and she wanted them to stay overnight, and uh, she blew them kisses when they left, but she got every tune. It was still there. It's, it, was, it was pretty amazing. And then uh, the Proverbs completion, well, here you, this is when you give the few words uh, of um, something like a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Judge not that you be not judged. These are ones we've standardized on a lot of Queen's people and older people. Uh, you can see the effects of the dementia are really kicking in. So it's not something just a literal memory that I've been sometimes told, oh, well, you're just picking up literal memories. No, because you go for these linguistic memories, and they are really starting to go. I mean, the young don't do so hot either, if you notice on the left-hand side. But you know, we're looking at an older generation here, and our tests are kind of geared towards picking up what older people can do. So the concluding comments are, is the glass full or half empty? This is one that I've been talking to with my friend Andrea Halpern because she's been working on this as well, and it depends. In aging, and increasingly so in dementia, deficits are found for the rapid manipulation of new information. And if you want to summarize a lot of research, music training is not a preservative. I mean, the music, you'll still be better, you know, if you've got music training on some of the musical tests, but it's not going to preserve it. You know, you're going to go down at about the same rate, generally. However, access to rich knowledge bases may be spared well into aging, and I've made this, and in the case of music, across stages of dementia. Some people want to say that this is semantic memory, but it's not, because semantic memory degenerates in Alzheimer's. This is, a, this is kind of, this is something rather special, we think. I like to think of some of this in terms of, you'll be very familiar, I think, some of you with the uh, Peretz Coltart um, model of the music processor. And I think, we, you know, you say, well, what is going on here? Well, of course, we don't know. I mean, that's what, our, what we're trying to do in our research. Um, I think that what we could say, if we want to look at our processing components and the di different components that might be going on in music processing and say that these are individual modules or whatever, that what might be happening is that we're getting access to the musical lexicon. That is the storage musical knowledge. How are we doing it? Well, there are a number of possibilities. One, through the emotion. I mean, we're not using the normal roots because people, the demented, cannot take in new music. You know, they cannot follow these, you know, the sort of yellow boxes there um, because these, a lot of these properties are gone. We might be accessing it through emotional expression, but then, if that's the only answer, why is their face recognition so bad? Why is their face recognition for their family so bad? I mean, there's emotional connections there, and we see it over and over again that they, within, as we come from moderate to severe, those memories, those recognition are gone. So it must be something specific to music if it's emotional. One thing I'm quite intrigued with is the vocal plan formation connection in this model. Because I think that possibly, even with the instrumental tunes that the AD patients can get, they're singable, like the Wedding March, or some of the others that uh, we've been working with. A lot of these are singable tunes, and maybe even have words to them in an informal way. It might well be that there's a connection there to the vocal plan formation of singing. Not speaking, you know, when we're talking about this dissociation or these, these modules. I mean, it's, it's, I'm not saying we um, can prove anything here with respect to this model, but I think it's helpful and I think our data support it. The last thing, I mean, we've been talking and thinking about a lot of these things. What is predictive of sparing? I mean, why is one person more spare, have more sparing than the other? Is it early music training and liking? We have no evidence of that at all. Now, I'm sure if you go to really difficult tunes and difficult musical materials, you'll pick that up. But when we're picking up just the music of the culture, it doesn't seem to be there. I mean, it can be preserved well into severe stages. 
With the severity of the dementia, well, yes, of course, there is a point in time where you, you lose the patient. You, you really can. I mean, it's terribly sad, and we have been in, and we just, just don't get any response. But until the patient is at that stage, it's amazing how the musical memories are preserved well into moderate. And moderate's pretty bad, really, in terms of functioning. Um, and well into severe with some of them. I'd like to think that affect had a lot, like the emotional side. I mean, I think we'll be working on that a lot. But as I said, why doesn't affect work with other experiences that the demented person has had? Why is it only working with music? And I think the vocalization or perhaps the rhythmic components, the motor components are going to have a lot to do with it. So um, I'd just like briefly to acknowledge a few people. Um, the, uh, Andrea Halpern, Isabel Peretz, and uh, Sela Olmsted uh, are the psychologists that I've been talking to. Ashley <coughs> Vanstone is my grad student, and um, Jackie Duffins, my medical colleague that I've been working with, and um, Dr. Leclerc is the guy that gave me the Alzheimer, the one that teaches the second year medical students, and gave me that slide. And Sadeep Gill is another medical person that helps us out. David Keane is a um, composer that helped me with, remember, the, back to the un the unfamiliar distorted melodies, and he checked them all out, that they you know, established a good tonality at the beginning and had the right kinds of mistakes in them and so forth. And the next four are my students in the lab and, and our funding. And that's that. Thank you. Thank you.